everybody. Welcome to tonight's episode of Signature Strong Live. My name is Matt Gardner. I am Signature Theater's Associate Artistic Director and the host of uh, this evening's show. Tonight, we're going to be talking about new musicals with some of the amazing performers who have been in recent world premieres at Signature Theater. Signature has been around for 30 years, and in that time, we have produced 50 world premiere musicals, uh, including musicals by John Kander and Fred Ebb, uh, Tom Kitt and Brian Yorkey, Cheryl Crow, uh, Michael John Lacusa, just to name a few. So new musicals are definitely a big part of our mission, and we're excited to talk about them more tonight. Uh, I hope you have a drink on hand because every week uh, we like to have a little drinking game. The drinking word this evening, well, actually, let me tell you first, there's a specialty cocktail. And uh, this week, it's the Sisters Clark Bourbon Cider, uh, which we're showing on the screen right now. It was served at Allie's Bar uh, during our recent run of Gun and Powder. Um, and you can see that recipe or you can check it out on our social media pages. And the drinking word this evening this is very important. You all love this. And I will try to slip it in as much as possible. The drinking word this evening is premiere. So anytime you hear me say the word premiere, take a sip of your drink. So we have an uh, awesome guest list tonight. Uh, throughout the show, if you have any questions for them, just type them into the Facebook uh, comment section and we will get around to those questions uh, as soon as possible. So let us get the ball rolling. I want to introduce you to the one and only Mr. Alex Brightman. Hi, Alex. Hello, everybody. How's it going? It's going very, very, very well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. So, Alex, we're going to start at the beginning for you. And that was your... That was very... That was so biblical. There you go. The beginning. So, your Broadway debut is actually... Was actually a show that's fairly close to Signature's heart. Yes, and I you were, Yeah, you were an understudy on a new musical, um, a legendary one. It yes, uh, yes. premiered at Signature. It went on to a, a very short-lived run on Broadway. Uh, that musical is called Glory Days. Can you tell yes, our yes. audience a little bit about that and about your experience working on that musical? Uh, yeah, it was one of those moments where you're, you know, you're seven years old in New York City, or so it feels, and you're kind of like thinking about what you're trying to do. And then a buddy of yours wrote this musical, and you go in an audition for it, and you go, well, it's not going to happen because I'm his friend, and also, you know, there's thousands of other people. And so then you get it, which is the miracle, and then you rehearse it with all these guys and become your friends and all that kind of stuff. And then you open this show, and for one night, you are the toast of New York City, truly. No other shows are opening. It's six guys, five of them making their Broadway debuts. Um, I'm like 19 at that point, and I just thought, I was like, this is it. And my parents were gonna fly out the next week to see the show. <laughs> if anybody knows the end of the story, they know why that's funny. Uh, <laughs> and then, you know, we had this great opening night party, and you, you were like, you know, it's, you're the center of this party, and it was this great experience. And the next day was our day off, and we got called into the theater, and we were told that we were closing. And when we asked when, they said last night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we, I think we hold, I, I don't, do we hold the record? Do we hold the record for fastest closing musical, James? Matt? <laughs> I don't, no, I don't think we hold the record. I think there are shows that closed in previews, but we definitely yeah, are right. among the like shortest runs of a Broadway musical. Well, but it I was like a badge. There you go. You should. We all do. And it's, yeah. you know, it's certainly a major part of uh, Signature's history. And I feel most lucky because it was the time that I got to meet you. Yeah. Oh, thanks. That's yeah. very nice of you to say. Yeah. Well, I, I, by the way, love the show. Like, I still do. Yeah. I tout it. I tout it proudly. The album is available. If anyone's never listened to it, the album is fantastic. And it just, I, you know, it's one of those things that you realize shows do one of two things. They open and they close. And that's a good proof of it is that some of them do it on the same night. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, not only you, you said you knew Nick Blameyer before you auditioned for it. And yeah. Nick wrote another musical uh, several years later that you and I got to work on together. And yeah. I would say for me personally is one of the things that I'm most proud of that I worked on at Signature. Like I, I tend to feel like I'm never more proud of anything than when it's a new musical, uh, just the work that goes into it. Um, but anyways, that musical was soon and you yeah. were, you were a part of that journey with me. So uh, I was, can I say, can, am I allowed to lightly swear on here? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean this with all sincerity. I was thinking about it all week. So I know I'm up to this thing. You directed the shit out of that, that show. 
And it was not just not just in the room and on stage, but but between things at the bar, talking about whatever you know, and, and just all the table work that went into it, and all the thoughtfulness that went into the cuts and rewrites. Is that that starts with the director going, "Hey, do you mind if we?" And I think that is really super duper important uh, for most directors to hear that, like, it's not just about go here, go here. It's what do you think about, and would you mind if, and do you think that. And so you're a very good uh, example of that. And I had a very, uh, I don't, I, I imagine, I, I think I was no trouble there. Um, <laughs> but that's because I was having a really good time and all the questions got answered. And I think we came up with something really, really something special. I, I mean, yes, I, I agree. I agree that, no, I don't agree that I was <laughs> spectacular, but I agree that the, the show was special and it was a special experience. That room was so great. Jessica and and Natasha and Josh Josh freaking Morgan the amazing Josh Morgan <laughs> that's, and, that's uh, his real middle name yeah and Darius Smith who we all miss yes and, uh, yeah but but what I mean what about that uh, was uh, so special for you like what about that piece was so special to you well that piece in particular I'll get to in one second but just any yeah. time that any actor gets to work on something original. That you, and it's not just about putting your stamp on it. That's fun too. But it's the idea that you're getting to work on something. It's the Sondheim thing. There's a hat where there's not a hat anymore. You're making something out of nothing. Somebody's brain came up with an idea, and you're that cog that in that machine that you hope is a part that makes it churn and, and click. And so when you click in and you find that like you're rehearsing a show that nobody's seen, there's just nothing better than that. And specifically with Soon, yeah. um, you know, it's. It was just a weird, hyper theatrical piece that I think only, in my opinion, can only be done in a theater, which I find spectacular. Like I think there are lots of things that can be movies and television shows, and I think Soon was one of those things that you had to experience in the theater. It was so atmospheric with all the weather changes and all the, you know, the weird, you know, like almost heightened supernaturalism that was in it. Some some of it. Um, yeah on the weird tilted sitcom set that we had that was oh, brilliant. Uh, yeah. But I just think it was great. And it, you know, it's super topical now. Right? Yeah. I feel every day I feel more, for those of you who don't know the show, it basically begins with a girl who is self-quarantined herself because the world outside is ending. Yeah. So uh, topical. Yes. It is right. Um, yeah. And I feel more and more like Charlie every day. <laughs> and I play, I play a Jew, which is also, it's also very topical because I am a Jew. Uh, Ah, there you go. Yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, let's, um, I'm going to let, on that note, I'm gonna <laughs> let James, James play a little clip of you from uh, the production of Soon at Signature. Okay. But what she does continues to confuse me because she's so great at equivocating that I may be dating the lady who'd rather I stay Alex Reitman. 
Um, so uh, since soon, you have made a name for yourself in some pretty high profile uh, Broadway type gigs. You play Beetlejuice and Beetlejuice. You played Dewey Finn in School of Rock. So um, you already sort of talked about what, what you love about doing new musicals. Is yeah. there a difference between doing it in a regional theater setting as opposed to these big commercial productions? You know, not really. I mean, I think even from doing community theater for free to doing Broadway, it's like, I think it was Judy McLean who told me, she goes, it's the same shit, bigger budget. And she's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, and it, that's how it feels, all the same stuff. And um, I will say the difference between doing something like Soon, which was felt super from the ground up, is that with Beetlejuice and School of Rock, I was having to honor an adapt adaptation right. and having to create a character, even though the character was created, so sort of, sort of recreating something. And yeah. so I came up with what I call the soup model, soup, yeah. as in, which is, you know, people like chicken noodle soup, which is the Beetlejuice in the School of Rock movie and all the source material. That's the stuff they like. And that's what keeps makes them feel at home. So yeah. what we did with School of Rock and Beetlejuice was we fed them just enough of that soup so we could give them gumbo and, you know, chili and, you know, all the other stuff. And so I think that's any sort of actor out there that tries to adapt something. That's a good way to go about it. Give them enough to what they love so you can then screw around uh, and do your own thing. Awesome. You know, you also, not only are you an, obviously an actor, you're also a writer and you've done yeah. a lot of new musicals of your own. You work a lot with Drew Gasparini and you, um, what, do you think that there are things that, what, what have you learned as an actor that you're able to take into the process as a writer? I guess is I, my question. It's a great question. I think the big one that I didn't know at all until I had to experience both sides of it is that if you're an actor and you're working on new material, when you get the material, read that material right away, that one. Don't add your own spin right away because these writers want to know if something's working. So it is not, it's not useful to try to go, well, what if it's this? Just right away, it's useful to say, these are the words that are written, this is the thing you're trying to deliver. Take it off the page. And that's, I think, having respect for the writing is great. And when you can have respect for the writing, then you get the writer's trust to go, all right, yeah, then now do your own thing. But I think it's I think a lot of actors make that mistake of trying to be bold and, and at first and try to do their own thing. Yeah. Are you guys working on something right now? Are, yeah. are you working? You are. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of stuff. Uh, the two things we're working together musical wise, we're doing uh, uh, Universal uh, Studios and theatrical. Uh, we've been working on the musical adaptation of It's Kind of a Funny Story, the, oh. it was a movie and a novel yeah. uh, about a, a kid who checks himself into a mental institution. Um, and we have a, a big fat uh, workshop coming up when this is over. We, it was unfortunate. We had like a very big thing about to happen and, sure. and uh, we will. And then the other thing is we're um, working on a, an adaptation of the children's book, The Whipping Boy. Uh -huh. um, and we are currently turning it into an animated feature. So, uh, which is, I, I'm, I, it's my first foray into doing that. And so it's our like step-by-step -step process of trying to like deconstruct the musical we had that we had fully written and it's all done and try to now do it as a cartoon. Amazing. That's uh, awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah. we have two questions from our audience. Okay. The first is from Hillary Lars and she says, if Alex will, uh, could sing one song for the rest of his life, what would it be and why? Oh, Jesus. Um, <laughs> <laughs> probably, you know, I gotta go, I, you think, to karaoke, right? So I think probably, I, can I give two answers? It doesn't yeah. matter. Of course I can give two answers. Oh, what no, is, yeah. Why We're, there's no rules? Uh, no. Nothing But a Good Time by Poison. Mm -hmm. And probably uh, Just the Way You Are, Billy, not Bruno. Ah, all right, all right. I like the choices. All right, we have another question from Marie Ireland. She wants to know, how do you get over a bad audition? They're all bad. Um, they are. They, yeah, you don't know if they, you you never know if they're good. They they're all, or they're all good. That's the other thing. And yeah. my here, this is my answer. Um, if you walk into an audition and you don't have the job, when you walk out, if you don't have the job, nothing's changed. But right. a lot of people think that by walking in that room, it's their part to lose, like they've already had it or something. And so they go, if I screw this up, then I won't get it. But it's like the part's never yours. It's it, parts are there to be won, not lost. So right. I, it's a thing. If you just go in and go, here's who I am genuinely, and here's what I have to offer. Would you like to work with me? Then they get to go, yes. And you go, cool. Now you have to pay me. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. It's, about, it's, an, it's, a, it's an introduction. It's a handshake. Auditions yeah. are handshakes. So as long as you're proud of the way you presented yourself, then it's not about whether you get the role or not. It's never the most talented. It's never the person. It's Absolutely. never the person you think it's going to be. That is awesome advice. All right. Hey, Alex. 
So what? stick around because we're going to come back to you at the end of this with other questions from the audience. And I'm out of here. Uh, no, stick around, please. So I want to uh, jump now uh, to uh, the star of Signature's most recent world premiere musical, and that is the one and only Saleya Pfeiffer. Hi, Saleya. Oh, unmute yourself, Saleya. <laughs> Oh, there you go. Hi. There you are. So, Saleya, so you were in Gun and Powder, which was the last, really the last full production we did in the Max Theater at Signature. And not only that, but you had, before doing Gun and Powder, you had seven months straight of work. You did uh, Evita at City Center. You did Almost Famous. You did um, uh, Light in the Piazza with Renee Fleming. And then you needed this vacation, but I imagine this is not the vacation you wanted. Oh my gosh. I, when this all really happened, because I remember I, I like when I had finally finished Gun and Powder and I, I came back to New York and I was kind of like, wow, I think I'm needing like, I, I think I need to go into hibernation for a little while and just kind of, kind of like praying to, to the universe a little bit, kind of being like, I just need a real break. Like I need no one to expect anything from me for like a week. And then this happened and I was like, am I, am I more powerful than I ever <laughs> possibly could have imagined? <laughs> but but um, no, it was, it was kind of a careful what you wish for kind of thing. But I will say that the downtime has been a um, massive silver lining to all this for sure. Cause I was yeah. so lucky, so lucky that these opportunities kind of bookended each other, that they was somehow able to like all these things that there was like no way I was going to say no. But like when it, when I really looked at everything that I had agreed to, I was like, yeah, <laughs> was this the best decision. And ultimately it was, you know, like I wouldn't trade any of those experiences for the world, but man, putting a new musical together is, um, yeah is something seven months to be handed gun and powder is that's yes. that's an undertaking yes it was an, and you know that that show and my role in that show it, it was heavy it was a heavy show but my gosh like that that company uh, that was so much fun I think like I laughed till I cried like every single day of that process so like I couldn't have asked for a better community to be you know I was it was such an energized group of people every day mm -hmm. that like coming coming in you know to rehearsal was just such a joy I was like no matter how how tired no, no matter what level of burnout I might have been experiencing it was just like who cares like I love get to do this I get to be with these people like my god I love that well you said um publicly you've said before that uh while you love playing the roles like in Evita and Light in the Piazza Really, your passion is in creating roles in new musicals. Can yeah. You talk a bit about that? Yes, absolutely. I mean, Gun and Powder was especially um, a really, really special experience to me because it was the first time that I have ever played myself. Um, there aren't the the mixed perspective, like the the mixed race perspective, isn't one that you really get a lot in musical theater. And yeah. I've been lucky that people have I've people have been willing to cast me as um, typically you know white ingenue roles. Like I got to be Clara, you know. I never thought I'd get to do that. Yeah. But there's something, not something, there, everything about getting to play yourself um, and getting to live your experience on stage and doing that for the first time at age 25 was kind of wild. We like we we had our first um, table read, and I remember at the end of it, I was just like thinking I was casually going to say like thank you Angelica and Ross for you know writing a role for me and for girls like me and for, for people like me. Um, and then as I was saying it, I was like, guys, just thank you for agreeing. Like, <laughs> like, Great, yeah, you yeah. Know? Um, but this was, I, I think, you know, other than maybe Showboat and like Passing Strange, this was the only other role that I don't have to kind of pretend to be something else or wonder if I'm passing, wonder if it's working, you know. Um, and ironically, it was a show about passing. And yeah. so to, to, to have a role that was so specific and felt like, you know, there was no way that I was, you know, wasn't going to be, there was no, I wasn't going to allow a reality where I didn't get to be a part of this process. Yeah. Um, you know, because I've never in my life seen myself specifically on stage on, you know, in I think the closest I ever got to that was Hamilton. And seeing that was like such a wild, you know, seeing someone like Pippa. I was like a, a, a mixed woman on on new person, whatever. I was like seeing myself for the first time. Yeah. And, um, you know, the characters that we Mary and Martha were these like complicated people. 
mm-hmm. with, you know, in, in a really complicated time in America that a lot of people, you know, don't don't know a lot about. So it just felt like this really important, really massive <laughs> moment for myself, both in my career and as, you know, for my identity as well. That's, that's yeah, I think amazing. I answered your question. <laughs> no, that's great. That's awesome. And it, you know, you you sort of been around this project for a long time. Like there mm-hmm. been workshops early on that that uh, very early in your time in New York you were part of, and then to see it happen at Signature, were you did you know like from the, its earliest iteration you were like this is going to have a life somewhere? I just know it is, or was mm-hmm. it? Uh, I mean, well, one of the coolest things was working with my peers, you know, getting to work with Ross and Angelica, who are so close in age. That was the first time that I felt like I could actually have, like, um, that sort of relationship with people I was working with. So that was exciting. But the first time I did it, we did it at NAMPT, and it was just, like, a 45-minute presentation. But we knew, you know, everyone involved in that iteration of it, I was like, this is really, really special, and this is really, really different. And, like, the response, I remember feeling, like, queen of, like, New World stages. We were, like, walking through, and everyone was like, we loved your show. <laughs> I was like, thank you so much. Like, catch me a signature in a year and a half. It's going to be sold out. (laughs) Amazing. I think we we all knew, we all knew there was something really special brewing. And I was just like, they better keep me. And, and, and luckily they did. Well, when Ross, when Ross and Angelica sent the script to uh, signature for our SigWorks program and Joe Calarco heard the demos, he literally pulled me into the office and went, you have to hear this. This is so special. And it's just, I, I just, I, for me personally, sitting in that audience, having had, I mean, so little to do with it other than working at Signature and seeing it happen, I just felt so proud that it was on our stage and it's Mm -hmm. so proud. So I'm going to let James play a little video right now of you singing Real Man from the production of uh, uh, Gun and Potter. because we can't actually see the clip you're seeing, but we're going to applaud it anyways. So, um, Saleya, uh, this is a question from Maura Allen. Um, mm-hmm. Maura wants to know, what was the best part about working at Signature? Oh, working at Signature? Um, there were so many great things about working at Signature. I mean, I mean down to like getting to work like lives so near to where I was working that was a first in my life I was like wow but that wasn't the best thing obviously but I think I would have to say the people yeah. um, I you know between ev- everyone involved all the people who on the administrative side of signature everyone made our lives so easy um, and then also just getting to meet so many um, actors who are based in Virginia. And I feel like I just got to meet this whole other community of extremely talented, kind and collaborative um, people who, you know, like it, it burst open a whole new um, access to all these new artists who who I now know and love. And, and work, you know, working out of New York sometimes, you're like, oh, I have to leave home or whatever. But like, it, it really, it was this amazing community of people that I feel like I now get to be a part of. 
Yeah. Love that. Like, we love like that. That's great. All right, well, stick around, Talia, because we're going to come back with more questions from the audience uh, in a little bit. Uh, so each week, uh, we feature a video message from a signature family member. It's either a staff member, an audience member. Uh, and tonight, we're going to feature a special message from our board member, Rush Shriek. Hey there, and thanks for taking the time to watch Signature Live. I've been on the Signature board for almost 10 years and have been going to Signature for my theater fix since the days of the garage. In fact, my first Signature show was 21 years ago, a world premiere of Candor and Ebbs over and over. There is nothing like a world premiere and is one of the things that makes Signature such an exciting venue for theater here in DC. I have two favorite Signature world premieres. One has to be Freaky Friday, a great musical based on a Disney movie with a fantastic cast that I saw with my then eight-year-old daughter. I'll never forget how mesmerized she was by the show and how excited she was waiting for the actors to come out to sign her program. She still has it today. And my other favorite has to be Gunpowder, a powerful examination of race and gender with a superb book and music, a play that has its sights set on New York sometime in the future. And speaking of the future, we are looking forward to returning to live theater with another world premiere, Camille Claudel. Until then, we have SIG Live every Tuesday to get our fix. Thank you for your continued support. And I know on behalf of the board and the staff here at Signature, we can't wait to welcome you back. All right, now I want to welcome to the show an actress who was set to star in the world premiere of Camille Claudel. Um, we were just days away from starting tech before, um, well, you know what happened. Um, so please welcome to the show, Teal Wicks. Hi, Teal. Hey, hey. So, Hi. Teal, how you doing? I'm okay. I'm doing okay. I'm <laughs> taking it a day and week is a time. I honestly don't even know, like... Yeah what's going on I feel it's like. crazy that it's been so much time has passed and yet i'm like what have i been doing for like two months now i have yeah. no idea yeah. spending yeah. a lot of time with brick behind me like yeah. a lot of time totally um <laughs> all right so we were in rehearsal you and I, I was choreographing camille you you were starring in it and what was it like to close a sh like not close like stop put pa push pause on this production right before we were about to go into like uh, check for it yeah i mean it was it was really bizarre it was so interesting because like because like the rehearsal process is so focused and also being like being out of town working on the new show you're you know not in your element i'm not with my my fiance like we're not you know in the same space i'm in my own space so like i really get tunnel vision on the project and the show which which I love to be able to do, but it sort of created this like bubble in a way that I, I sort of was distracted from what was really, really going on in the rest of the world. And I was keeping track of the news, but not letting it really sink in. Right. So like the last like couple days of rehearsals when every day we were like, are we, is this still happening? Are we still doing this? Are we okay? It was just, it was so bizarre to be so focused. And then all of a sudden that bubble like was popped. Yeah. And I remember our last day, our last rehearsal, like we came into rehearsals and basically you guys, like Eric was kind of like, well, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta stop. We have to stop this. And the rest of the day I was like, I guess I'm going to pack up my apartment. And I figured out how to rent a car to drive back to New York. And it was just, it was such a weird, like just shift um, to be so focused in this, like, cultural, creative place. And, you know, like, when you're creating something, especially when you've been doing it for, I mean, we were, what, like, three weeks into it, I guess, maybe? Into rehearsals and really... Because putting together a brand new show is very intense um, and very complicated. And there's, you know, we were figuring out a lot of stuff and making a lot of changes and, like, really kind of shaping what we wanted to bring and we were reaching that point where we're like well now we're excited to get on a stage and to figure out what it's like in this on the stage and it's just it's <laughs> to have that like rug pulled out you're just kind of like what and so coming back to new york and having nothing to do was really weird 
I had this all this energy, so I was able to kind of focus it into random things, like I was like random projects. I did a lot of cleaning and organizing right off the bat, and a lot of creative inspired sort of home projects, which so t- slowly started to like peter away. And then maybe two or three weeks after being home, I think I went into like not depression, not not real, but I just also know I was very sad and very like didn't want to get out of bed, and I was like, I don't understand. I don't know what I'm supposed to do now. Yeah. It's it's weird. weird. It's like weird. you know, I I have a friend who said she's always saying when you're working on something really intense and it's done, there's always kind of like the, the energy balance super shifts, so you have a very a big fat lull where you can be really exhausted or just right. The super down, so it was it was that weird balancing. Well, listen, someday, someday soon, it is gonna happen, and you are <laughs> you're going to be Camille Claudel in the max. So I want to talk a little bit about the show itself for a yeah. second. And you know, you have done a lot of new musicals, and recently you played Share and Share the musical, and now you're playing another iconic leading lady in Camille Claudel. Yes. So what is it like? Creating or approaching a role that's based on a real person. I mean, I realize there are videos to watch of Cher. There aren't videos to watch of Camille. But like, what is the what is that like? Well, it's funny. Um, I feel like I've actually almost almost all of the roles that I have played in my life, um, except maybe just maybe like three, have all been based on real people. So. I, lo- I love researching show- I shows. I love researching roles. I love researching the time period. Like, I, I wish I had folk- I'd done this much research and work when I was in college because I might have... I did okay, but I probably would have done better. Um, but it's just, like, I, 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 l- I love researching it. And I find even if a role is not necessarily based on a true person, I find enough real people and uh, based in reality and history that makes it feel kind of like a real person. So I really enjoy that. I like being able to grab on to like hard, true facts and figuring out how that will inspire the role and how those, those things like will resonate with me personally and how I'll try to manifest it into this character. Um, But it's also like, like, yeah. yeah. What, what specifically then, I mean, I agree with you. Like part of the reason I love being a director is just like digging into the, the history of it, and then finding the one thing that really just sort of is a launching point for me or like why I really want to delve into that story. So what was it about Camille's story? I mean, maybe it wasn't the story, maybe it was their script, but what was it about Camille that was so fascinating to you? Oh yeah, I mean, she, so much. I think I, I think it started with the script because I didn't know all that much about her. Um, I, I loved uh, I love Auguste Rodin, and I remember in being in Paris. The first time I went to France, I went on a trip with my dad, and like on his agenda was to go to the Rodin Museum. And I going there and seeing his work in person. I've always been a huge admirer of his sculptures, and so just the link to him was very very fascinating to me. Um, and then I think in the script, just seeing they she's such a passionate, full of life character this woman who's also very complicated and layered and I just find that so intriguing so wanting to figure out what those layers are was a huge draw for me um and I always like I like people who fight really really hard and I always like a little under layer of darkness yeah in characters I don't know I just find it I find that something very grounding and I find it very real um authentic yeah, and it's it's those things. I mean, she has a very, very, very sad story. Yeah. But she was such an incredible artist, and she, the what was ended up being her sort of downfall in the end was what made her such a brilliant artist. Like her her sort of mental emotional life was such was in such chaos um, at a time where nobody knew how to sort of deal with that. But it made her such a hard worker and made her so uncompromising in the work that she did that may that she has a legacy maybe that took you know decades a century for people to recognize but it's still there like her work that you can see you can see how incredibly talented she was so it's all of that it's like 
Yeah. yeah that's All amazing. So, um, so unlike Alex and Saleya, we don't have any production footage to show our audience because we never got to the point where we could shoot anything. But yeah, you yeah. were kind enough to, to, to allow, or to promise that you'd shoot a little video of you singing one of the songs from the show that's never been heard before. This is by Frank Wildhorn and Nan Knighton. And do you want to like do a little introduction of it? Tell sure. us yeah, what yeah. this moment is. Yeah, the- I actually kind of forgot that because there's a few songs from this show that um, that are well known that Linda Etter had has recorded. Um, but this is this song is called Voices, and I don't think it existed until this new version of the show. And um, it's it's so funny because the song actually feels very relevant in a sense right now. It's in the show, Camille is this. I don't know if this is too long. Anyways, but no, Camille is visiting. Um, uh, Rodin takes her and they visit Renoir, um, Renoir studio, and he has this like aviary, this like of of birds that are caged in, and there's this song where basically Camille is singing to the birds <laughs> about being like, "Hey, you're in a cage. I'm sorry. That sucks." I understand because I, I too feel like a cage bird. <laughs> that's a good. That's that. That is what's happening in the show. I don't um, know. Well, it's, this is a beautiful song, and uh, we're gonna play it for you now. I believe that you remember what it was to. When your voices sing, your dreams return you to the sky. Voices that could be suddenly set free if there were no bars. Voices shouldn't fade underneath the blurry stars. You do not belong in a world where song is captive. If you That was beautiful, Teal. So thank you for doing that. And uh, what is it? Here's my question for you. What is it like to sing? Here is this man, Frank Wildhorn, who has written some of the great musical theater epic ballads for, especially for women, right? Yeah, so yeah. what is it like to sing one of his songs that really nobody sung before you? Um, it's it's daunting. It's daunting. It's because I think of all of the gorgeous voices that have sung his songs, and I. I can't help but be like, I 
wonder what she would have sounded like this or what would she have done? And you want to put your own take on it and be authentic and true to yourself, um, but also sound really good. Um, yeah. I don't know. It's tricky. I, I find like doing a video like that is harder than just getting up and singing it because when you get up and singing it, it's a very different experience and you can live the song. But when you're making a video and you're like watching it, you nitpick and you're like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> so it's 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 tricky. Yeah, it's very tricky. But they are beautiful songs. And um, the, what I love about Camille Claudel is the music. One of my favorite Frank Wildhorn songs ever is called uh, "Woman in His Arms," uh-huh. and it's from Camille Claudel. And I heard that song before I knew the show, and I, it's it has always been my favorite song of his. So it's always been like I'm like, ooh, what is this show that this song is from? It's just that his music and Nan's lyrics are so, they're so lush and beautiful and very, very like feminine and powerful and, and sensual. And it's such, it's such a beautiful score. Yeah. So it's, it's daunting because it's a lot. It's a big, big sing. It's a big yeah. sing. Um, but it's such lush music. It's, it's really beautiful. So awesome. I am excited to eventually do it for real. Yeah. Well, we have an, a question from our audience. People are very interested in people's experiences in, in uh, at Signature in D.C. So the question is, what's the best thing about working out of town and favorite thing about the D.C. area? Oh, great. Um, yeah. Well, I, I do love working out of town. I love to travel. I love being in new, new places. I love I love being a stranger in a, in a new place, in a strange town. Like, it's, I find it, I've always loved that, so... It's fun to discover what this world is and to work on a project in a new town. It, it's lovely. Like I was saying earlier, you kind of get to really focus on what you're doing and your normal day to day life. If you're at home, doesn't really come into play, which is nice for, you know, a little bit of time. And then eventually you're like, OK, I want that back. But <laughs> but it's that's that's really, really lovely. So I love that. And then being in the D.C. area, I haven't I've only spent a little bit t- of time down there and. As close as it is to New York, it's still far enough away that I remember being just being down there, coming back to New York. I was like, "Whoa, New York isn't as springy as it was down down in D.C. Like, so much more springy and warm down there where I just came from. Why isn't New York like happening?" So, it's just it was it was it was so beautiful to be there and to like go running outside the 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 nature paths and like running and biking trails along the river and through through the woods and all of that are glorious and it was such a fun beautiful way to go off and explore when i had downtime so i really like the last my last day off in dc i got a bike and went and rode around the mall to see the cherry blossoms which i've never seen before and and so that was that was very special for me Awesome, awesome. That's great. So, hey, we're going to come back to you in a little bit with some more questions from the audience. Uh, keep sending in your questions for Alex, Teal, for Salea. We have a very special guest now. I'm very excited to introduce her to you. Um, she is Signature's production stage manager, Carrie Epstein. Hi, Carrie. Oh, hello. Greetings from my gracious living room. <laughs> yes. So, Carrie, you've been at Signature for 14 years now, and yeah. that do you have any idea how many productions you've stage managed at Signature? Uh, well, yes, I do, Matt. As you might be to be surprised, I have a spreadsheet that I keep track of, and I've had a little bit of time to update it. Uh, so I have uh, complete uh, 67 productions at Signature. That doesn't count events or workshops or things. That's full-on yeah. productions. Amazing. Well, listen, because you have done so many world premieres, we think... I'm sorry, what was that, Matt? You've done so many shows, and you've done no, so no, many... No. Oh, world premieres, premieres, premieres. Mm-hmm. We we think you might have, um, other than Eric Schaefer and myself, but probably better because there are many rooms that Eric and I have not been in. You probably have the best knowledge of the Signature Theater world premiere trivia. Yeah? Like history. Let's hope. Yeah, world premiere, yeah. So we thought we'd play a little game of new musical trivia. Okay. Um, it's a lightning round. Ready, so I'm going to give you, we're going to put 90 seconds on the clock, and you are going to answer as many block. of okay, these okay. questions as you can in 90 okay. seconds. All right. All right. I'm going to, uh, James, have we started the clock? 
Yeah, okay, great. So question number one, who directed the world premiere of Sycamore Trees? Tina Landau. Yes, finish this lyric. First the silence, damn the dark, you are? Oh, not alone. Yes. Okay. Yep, correct. Uh, which Tony Award winning actress starred in a play with music by James Lapine? Deborah Monk. Yes. What was the name of that world premiere? Mrs. Miller does her thing. Great. In the musical Freaky Friday, what object caused mother and daughter to switch bodies? A magical hourglass. Yes, correct. Um, uh, which of Signature's favorite composers also wrote New York, New York? John Kander. Yes. What's his most recent musical that also premiered at Signature? Kid Victory. Correct. Finish this lyric by the composer of Signature's world premiere production of Diner. All I want to do is have some fun until the sun comes up over. Over Santa Monica Boulevard. Correct. Name that songwriter. Joe Crow. Okay, which DC based composer has had the most world premiere productions at Signature? Matt Connor. Correct. This musical had its American premiere at Signature. It was so popular that we bought it back in 2015. The Fix. Yes. What was Signature's first world premiere musical? That one might be hard. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Um, not the Millhouse, not the. Mm, it was before my time. We're going to uh, skip that one. We're going to skip that. Lifeline. Uh, it's the Rhythm Club. Okay, what is your favorite world premiere musical you've done at Signature? The Visit. And what is your favorite director? Matt Gardner. Correct. Okay, <laughs> excellent. Yeah. I don't know exactly how many you got, but I think it was close to like 14 or 15. So Woo! Gary Epstein, you win the day. Woo! Thank you. Great job. Now I'm going to bring back onto the screen, um, Teal and Saleya and Alex for some final questions uh, from our audience, I think. Yes, maybe. Um, waiting to see if we get any. <laughs> well, please. Nobody cares. It hasn't come in yet. Uh, but listen, so I want to say, um, I want to ask each of you, uh, just sort of generally like, oh, no, here we got one. We got one. We're going to go with this. Good, that was a good riff so though. Good riff, from, Yeah, you know, so this is from Tiffany. Tiffany, we have a question for Alex from my son. He'd like to know what was the best show you've ever done fun-wise and when did you start acting? <laughs> I, that that if those are two total are those totally connected? different questions. <laughs> okay, okay. What was what was your favorite? Like what was the most fun to do? And when did you start acting? The most fun I ever had, aside from soon at Signature, was um, the uh, the History Boys. It was the um, L.A. premiere of the History Boys by Alan Bennett. It was a three hour play. We did the unabridged version. Um, it was you know an in incredible uh, play, but also I got to work with the National Theater. And they repeat, you know, I didn't realize how much I wanted to work with them until I got to work with them. And then uh, I got to play a role that I had never, ever really got to experience before. I got to play someone very, you know, kind of out of my comfort zone. And uh, I had a really good time sort of being on my own professionally. So that was the mo most fun I've ever had. And it sort of started my career a little bit. So oh, wow. I, I always have fond memories of the History Boys. And I started acting when I was eight years old. I played Tiny Tim in A Christmas Carol at my community theater in San Jose, California. Amazing. And the other part of that question is, do you have any advice for a budding young actor? If, you, if you've done a show, then you're not a budding young actor, you're an actor. So um, yes. I don't like when people say aspiring or struggling. Um, but my advice is that uh, talent, I say this to everybody, talent is subjective, but kindness, niceness, and generosity are undeniable. So those are the things to work on first and foremost, because you can't help your talent. Uh, 100%. Yeah. Uh, this question is for Saleya. It is from Courtney. She asked, what inspired you to do Broadway? What inspired <laughs> me to do Broadway? What inspired me to do Broadway? Well, what can't they have done so Broadway quite yet. That, <laughs> one of these days, one of these days it'll happen. <laughs> but, um, oh, what is my, you know what? I was a big camp kid. And I went, I remember I went to theater camp when I was like eight years old and I was like, these are my people. I am thriving. This is what I want to do. And, um, I think ultimately when I really, and as corny as it sounds, um, the people are the best thing about getting to have a life in theater. It's just kind of 
if you can make it happen for yourself, it's like the funnest, it's the most fun path you can kind of take in life. And so when I realized that it would check so many boxes that meant so much to me, it kind of felt like a no brainer. There was never really a plan B for me. It's just what I wanted to do. And then it has somehow kind of worked out. But as far as Broadway goes, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this question is for Teal. Um, <gasps> from Kenny and they want to know Teal uh are there any historical or living women you'd love to play in a musical oh lord um my goodness <laughs> that's I don't know how to answer that because the the list is very very long and it's always evolving and um I I don't know I Martha don't know Stewart. <laughs> did you say Martha Stewart why not <laughs> It's so funny. I've actually, I've been watching, I started watching the, the, the show Mrs. America. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can and play right now I'm like, ooh, I'll, I'll, I want to be Gloria Steinman in a music Steinman. called Gloria yeah. Steinman. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> if anything, just so I can wear those clothes and those sweet aviators. I'll, I'll watch like, a fucking musical, oh, sorry, a musical <laughs> of Gloria Steinem. I mean, come on. Yeah. I feel I like that was an appropriate word choice for Gloria Steinem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. All right. There you right. go. This is from um, Carrie. Mm -hmm. or, no, this is for Carrie. Um, what is your best advice for stage managers? Have a good amount of patience, love the art that you do, love the people that you do it with, and learn how to unjam a copier. <laughs> and one more question for you, Carrie. Yeah. What's the, your craziest understudy story? And that's from Walter Ware. Oh, Walter. Um, <laughs> Gosh, we have had uh, lots of really impressive understudy stories. I think the one that we're, just jumps to mind, um, during uh, Jesus Christ Superstar, we had a massively talented three-person swing team. They were really, really amazing. And there was one show where we had to put all three of them on in different roles than what they understudied for because we had injuries and illnesses and whatever. And it was, it was a, it was a two show day. Cause it always happens on a two show day. Um, or in the dinner break between the matinee and the evening, we had to figure out how one swing was going to cover two. It, it was crazy, but they did such a great job. So it was a intense moment, but God and love all of them. Proud. Yes, it certainly did. Yeah. Proud. Awesome. Well, I want to say thank you for so much for joining me. Uh, and for being such great guests. Next week's episode is uh, going to be all about uh, the musicals of John Dempsey and Dana Rowe. Um, so join oh. us as we talk about The Witches of Eastwick, The Fix, Brother Russia, Blackbeard, all musicals that uh, had productions at Signature. They'll be joined, um, Eric Shape will be hosting. Uh, he'll be joined by John and Dana, as well as Rachel Zampelli, Kevin McAllister, and Doug Krieger. So definitely check that out. And until then, everyone stay safe and stay home. And here to send us off is a clip of Freedom by Angelica Sherry and Ross Baum from the musical Gun and Powder, performed by Emmy raver Lapman and uh, Celia Pfeiffer. Oh. that word again it's a feeling that you can pin down but it feels good don't it don't it I thought so too there's a whole lot a little bit of freedom can do I'm glad I get to share it I knew freedom, but I thought I did Like an outlaw, I chased it down And I took it, I stole it, and I stored it away Then I found you Now I see all the freedom found in love in a man But it was never
here's some freedom It should help my love Go and spend it And spend it well Go on Go, go on, on your way, way. I, I think, think that's, that's best for you If I asked you would come with me I know you would You'd lay your whole life on the line For me if you could But I won't take your freedom away And it's the hardest thing I've ever